introducing me, David Fox, from JPY in the UK, and introducing Andre Kunemund, who is one of RQWare's uh, support gurus, who is currently in Boston, if I'm correct, Andre. Hello, everyone. Yeah, Manchester by the sea, Manchester just north east of Boston. Excellent. And I'm just south of London. So that's our geography sorted out. So today we are going to be talking, let's just get the uh, the slides going, about some of the new things in P5 Synchronize. So P5 Synchronize is ArcuWare's clone product, which is able to clone your data. First, before we go into the new stuff, just a few sort of things about what Synchronize is for the uninitiated. Um, it's basically a product which, a module which runs alongside RQS backup archive products. And it makes live backups of your data by cloning files and folders between one disk and another, hence the picture on the left hand side. So it creates effectively a live backup which could be updated as frequently as every hour. Um, and rather than a backup, in the traditional sense that you have to restore files from to get access to it because we're synchronizing a file system replicating a file system you can immediately access the results of that replication over on the target storage um, as such it can be used for failover so you could switch directly over to that shared storage that you've been replicating to if your primary storage fails without needing to restore so it has some kind of unique advantages over doing a traditional disaster recovery backup. A um, few other points, we can utilize cheaper storage. So invariably the, the target of a sync will be to cheaper storage than the faster storage that is the destination, uh, the source of the sync. Um, we can use the events that the operating system uh, generates to show us where changes have been made to save us looking through the entire file system to see where the, the changes have made since the last time we did a replication. We have additionally, the ability to create snapshots, point in time versions of the data, also individual file level versions. Um, I've put data migration here because we often see this tool used by our partners for migrating uh, when a customer upgrades their storage. It's a fantastic way of migrating all of the customer's data from their existing maybe RAID um, array to a new RAID array that they've purchased. Um, you can make filters inside of synchronized plans to exclude or only include data based around filters that you create based around kind of um, regular expressions, wildcards, date ranges and so on. Uh, the jobs can be automatically scheduled or run manually and everything is um, covered under RQWare's reporting. So you can have email reports of replication jobs running. You can um, use the web interface to see what's been going on, what's running, how much data it copied, how long it took and so on. So some nice reporting built in. So what's cloning look like in terms of some kind of diagram showing a network topology? Let's start with the most simple example. On the left-hand side, we've got P5. Let's do some mouse moving. Hopefully, you can see my mouse. Uh, on the left-hand side, we've got P5 running on that box with some storage attached. Over on the right-hand side, we've got another host running P5 as a client with some storage attached. And there's a local area network running in between. So in this example, we're looking at a single office where customer is looking to replicate from their live P5 server on the left-hand side to the client P5 on the right-hand side. They, they might both be file servers. Invariably, the left-hand one would be the live storage that people are using to do their work. On the one on the right-hand side, probably not shared out to everybody, just sitting there and collecting a copy of all the changes as they're happening throughout the day in case it's going to be needed at some point in the future. So that's a simple land-based synchronization. And then if we kind of advance this a little bit, you'll see at the bottom now we're going across a wide area network, a WAN, between London and New York on the right hand side. So if you have a customer or if you are a customer where you've got more than one office, you can use Synchronize to replicate data between locations. So obviously you've got to have like maybe a VPN or some kind of firewall configuration to allow one P5 to talk to the other P5 at the other location. Often a VPN would be used for that because it's going to secure your data if it's going across a public network. Um, so this opens up much many more combinations because now we can effectively create an off-site copy of your backup, which is a much more 
relevant to a disaster recovery scenario because with a disaster it could take out the London office on the left but you've got a copy of all of your data at the remote site which you could then maybe replicate back once you've fixed the problem in London. So because we can go between sites with P5 the next scenario is we have like a hub and spoke set up with London in the middle as maybe the head office of an organization and then we have various satellite offices around the outside Paris Munich etc and what we can do is synchronize data between the central location where we have our p5 synchronized installation and these remote p5 client installations and remember p5 runs on Mac Windows Linux Solaris Synology QNAP lots of different platforms so you could have maybe um, some expensive video edit storage in London and just having a Synology in Hong Kong would allow you to be replicating data out to that remote location. Um, traditionally the server will talk to the clients but it's also possible as you see at the bottom where I have Munich on the bottom left and New York on the bottom right. We can have a synchronized plan as indicated by this arrow going between those two sites that is synchronizing between two clients. So London can basically run the schedule that tells Munich to send a copy of its data to New York and vice versa. So all possible paths between the, all of the clients and servers that we have in our P5 configuration, all of those paths can be traversed by your data. So that puts over to you, oh, one more. Um, the, the P5 server could of course be related, uh, related could be installed in the cloud. Um, so, uh, one common example where we see P5 servers being deployed is Amazon Web Services, where you can run a Linux uh, CPU and attach some amount of storage to it. Once you've done that and got the software running on a cloud server, you can then use that to replicate multiple remote sites. So you could have that connecting out and attaching to P5 clients running in um, maybe several different offices of a company and copying all of those those locations data back to a Linux machine with storage attached in the cloud that you own, that you kind of don't own, but you have full control over. So that's your server that you're paying for to run in the cloud. And that way you can get an offsite backup of all of the premises that you have ownership of to a remote premises that is, is going to be safe. So thinking about what's new, in version 5.6 of Synchronize, which contained quite a few new features, not all of which we're covering here, but we're covering the main ones. So we're going to be looking from now on at these five new features. Um, so without reading that list out, we're going to go through each of those one by one now and just summarize. And then I'm going to hand over to you, Andre. You still there, Andre, in Boston? I'm here, yeah. Uh, to give us a bit of a a bit of more of a live demo of what that stuff looks like and Andre's then going to talk about a couple of support issues that we thought might be of interest to the to the wider community and um, again if any questions are occurring to anybody while we're talking I'm just having a look nobody's asked a question yet then please uh, type your question in if it's specifically about p5 sync then great and we can talk about that at the end so number one of the new features is called reverse connection client to server so the scenario for this is where you've got a P5 server maybe uh, located in a cloud location and you've got a bunch of offices starting with the one on the left, the customer site, and you want to replicate that into your cloud storage. So this is the scenario that we were just talking about. Um, but what you'll often find is that uh, the client locations will generally be protected for, from incoming TCP IP connections by a firewall of some sort. And I mean, a customer would be crazy not to have their network connected from incoming TCP IP by a firewall, right? So that's always going to be there. That means that if you want to have the P5 cloud-based server coming in, taking a copy of data, you're going to have to do some configuration on that firewall, firewall, which might not always be convenient or easy to get past the IT department of that corporate. So what this feature allows is that you can configure the client with a permanent connection that it keeps open to the P5 server. 
Uh, so you configure the client to know about the P5 server. And because that's an outbound connection, Firewall is going to be OK with that because that's just a regular outbound connection via TCP IP. Once that's set up, then the P5 server will be configured maybe to, to, to take a replication of that site every hour. Every time it wants to do that, it can effectively use the connection that's already been opened by the client and uh, not have to make uh, the, a new connection. It's kind of reusing the one that already exists. So by doing that, you can overcome the kind of networking issues that people will often have. And it makes it much more easy to deploy this cloud-based P5 server backing up offices than it previously was. Second new feature, oh, before we get to the second new feature, just a couple of screen grabs. So you see here we have the remote P5 server on the left-hand side. This exists on the client machine. So this is basically where you will plumb in the details of the cloud-based P5 server in our example. And once that's done and you've tested the connection and it's and it's live, then it's simply a case on the right hand side of adding the P5 client via the regular uh, adding a client window that you may already be familiar with. The only difference is when you're doing it this way, you're providing the host ID of that P5 client rather than its IP address. Its IP address may change over time, of course. So um, we don't need to worry about the specific IP address of the client. We just need to reference it via the host ID, which is um, easy to easy to get a hold of once you've uh, set that client up. <clears throat> so the next thing we're going to look at is two-pass delete mode. So this is a, a new feature specifically designed to address the issue where um, previously P5 Sync would always work its way folder by folder through the data that it's synchronizing across. And if it first comes across new files to copy, then it will do that. If later on it comes across files that are missing that need to be deleted, it'll perform the deletes. So in my example here, I've got two folders of new data to synchronize across and two folders of uh, data which has now been deleted. So my storage over on the right hand side might be quite full up <clears throat> and the new folders of data might be quite large. So traditionally when copying those new folders across, there's a, there's a risk that we might fill up the storage. And because of the ordering of the data here, we're gonna be doing the copying the new folders first and we come across the deleted folders later. So this is, doesn't really suit this particular use case because here we clearly need to delete the data first to make space before we copy the new files across. So that's exactly what the two pass delete mode uh, enables to happen. So this is not the, the default option is the single pass. But if you have issues around, um, you know, the kind of issues that I've just explained, then by enabling two pass delete, all we do is we go through the data on the left hand side twice, first of all, looking for data to delete. So we, we would ignore these two new folders and delete these two folders that already exist on the target because we'd previously copied those across. That makes space. And then and the second pass, we'll look, be looking for the new data, which will then copy across. So this avoids issues where you fill up your storage and get into a, a difficult situation where you then have to find something to delete in order to be able to continue with the syncing. And then when the syncing continues, invariably, you're going to fill up again. So uh, this is great for customers who kind of run close to the limit of the, of the storage capacity on the target and uh, is going to make things a lot easier. So that's just an option that you can enable that so Andre will show us that <coughs> where, where that's enabled shortly. OK, number three, uh, throughput tuning. Um, so this is an experimental feature, largely because the, the times that you're going to get benefits from it will depend very much on the kind of storage that you're using and maybe also on the size of files. So by default, when you're running uh, a synchronize with P5, there'll be a single task that will run as depicted by this arrow and that will be copying a file across the, that network connection and when it's finished it will it'll move on to the next file so there'll only be ever one file being written on the target one file being read on the source and a single tcp ip network stream performing that data transfer so with this uh, performance tuning you can increase um, up to reasonably large numbers of independent uh, software threads that are doing the the reading the transferring across the network and the writing independently of each other so if you were to have four of these parallel file transfers that means there'll be four files being written on the on the target machine and there'll be four separate uh, 
network transfers taking place. So from our experience, we've seen gains in performance when enabling this for two main reasons. The first is network related. And if the network connection between the two machines is maybe going across um, an internet connection to a cloud uh, storage provider, quite often that, that particular network transfer will be throttled up to a certain limit. And that limit may be slower than the total upload bandwidth that you have with your internet connection. So by running two, you may well get double the transfer rate to the cloud provider because you're utilizing that throttle twice. Um, the other reason is relating to SSDs. A single stream copying uh, files to SSDs, which have very fast write performance, where you've got a lot of small files, will not fully utilize the speed of that SSD storage. So by multiplying the number of writes going on simultaneously, especially with small files, where there's some overhead to locating each file, you'll get better overall throughput. So experimental, but definitely something worth playing with to see what kind of results you get with it. Number four, Restore from sync. So this is a new piece of UI. We're looking at the uh, synchronized module administration here within our synchronized plan. Uh, you'll see I've got four sync plans here. Each has a unique target folder in this column over here. I'm hoping you can see my mouse moving. Um, so you can see this file share, Kerio sync are all the target folders that we're synchronizing to. So if you wanted to recover a file, let's say from the Kerio email backup, that's what this feature lets you do. So you simply move over to the restore tab and under synchronize, you'll see four browsable locations, which will allow you to browse those target directories that you've been replicating data to immediately. So if I were to click into the Kerio restore location, you can see at the top here and browse down to a particular folder, I could choose a user like Francesca here, and I could choose then to uh, sync to via this button, and then I get to browse all of my storage locations again, and I can choose to copy that directory from the target of my synchronization back to some other location, because maybe Francesca accidentally deleted a lot of her email, so I'm now visiting my replica of her email folder, and I'm going to choose maybe to copy it back to my own machine, and then I figure out what to do with it from there. So that's restoring from a synchronized target locations, much in the same way that you would synchronize from a backup except it's going to instantly copy that data for you or not instant but immediately begin and number five manual sync um, this is basically where you can trigger a source and a destination for a sync without having to configure a whole sync plan just to do it so this if you're doing a one-off copying some data migrating a server manual sync appears here in the left hand side of the sync tab and basically lets you browse source, dire source directory in the background. You can see I've picked this administration folder. And then in the popover window, we're choosing a selection, a, a destination directory. I get access to all my configured clients on the left-hand side. I could choose to copy, as in this example, to my desktop. And then I hit select folder. And that's going to run that job as a one-off, as an update sync, copy that data, and then we're done. But it will show up in the job monitor where you can see how it's going. OK, so that's a quick overview of those five new features. Um, so with that, Andre, I would like to uh, hand over control to you. OK. So let me just do that now. I have to unmute first. Bear with us while we just switch screens from London to Boston. So I'm going to make you the presenter, Andre. Uh, you have to make the presenter show main screen, yes. All right, can everybody see my screen? I can see it, so I assume everybody else can. OK, so let's go down the list real quick of uh, all the new features in 5.6 that David had already mentioned. Um, let's see. So the first one was reverse connection. So you'll find that once you're logged into P5, so the server interface, or on a client, on a client, all of these things will be grayed out. Um, but you'll find the agent setup under P5, agent setup. And there's your P, uh, remote P5 server, you click new, and that's where you would enter the IP address that client can contact the P5 server at, plus the port, 
on a Synology, this would be 20,000. For any other platform, it will be 8,000 unless you change that. And then the login ID and password needed to log into the server. Once you have that uh, set up, that part of portion on the client. Worth pointing out that you can do that without a license as well, can't you? So even if this is uh, typically Correct. with a client P5 installation, you, you put your license on the server and the client doesn't need to have any license, but you can still get to that configuration uh, area without without having the key installed. Let me just try something. I log in on a client. Yeah. I hope it doesn't have a license installed. Uh, Fingers crossed. Is that one that client's asleep? Doesn't look like it's going to respond. Yeah, but that's definitely the case. So we. Yeah. So anyway, so on a client that doesn't have any licenses installed, all of these buttons up here would be grayed out, but you'd still be able to get to this menu here. Actually, your tab just lit and, up, so you could probably you could probably get there now. Uh -huh. Super secret password. Yeah. So as you can see, all of those buttons are grayed out. This client doesn't have any licenses installed, but you can still get to the agent setup. Yeah. On the server, you would then set up that remote client like any other server. But as David mentioned, you would put in that client's host ID in here instead of the IP address. Um, back to home. So. The other new feature was the delete first or the two pass um, sync. This came about um, because one client said, yeah, I have this problem. My disk is almost full and I start the sync plan. It runs out of space and then it, the job just aborts and I never get my data synchronized. Even though had all these files and folders been deleted, there would have been plenty of space. and by the way, rsync has an option that, that would delete first and then copy. And so we uh, added that feature to um, P5 Synchronize, and it's found, let me just grab one of these plans. I think it's under expert settings. Yeah, so here you have deletion mode. Yeah. So the default would be to delete and copy in one pass, but you can change that if you need to as David pointed out, it will require two passes, so it's gonna take some extra time, but it would force the deletion of data that's no longer needed first, and then copy any new or modified files. So that's where that is. Yeah, there's quite a, quite a common support case um, with people doing synchronization that they would run out of space. We would see that every, every couple of months or so. So this is a okay. nice addition right. to have, yeah. Um, throughput tuning is on, under the next tab, and you can see that here. You can change that to a maximum of four. It's experimental, so we didn't want to open it up to, let's say, unlimited. And it's definitely like it's like a you have to try it, see what works, see if you get any improvements, or if you get improvements up to a certain point, and then the performance goes down again. But it's mainly intended to be used with SSDs. Yeah. Um, restore from sync, I know you've already seen the screenshots, but historically, you if you clicked on the restore button, you would have seen backup, backup to go in archive. With 562, we now also have a synchronize, restore from synchronize option. And the reason for that was it's easy to get data synchronized from a source to a target, but then when you had to restore something, let's say a user said, oh, I accidentally deleted that folder, um, I need it back. An administrator would have to find some other way to copy that folder from the synchronized target back to the source. And now you can do all that from within the P5 GUI. It means that regular users that are familiar with restoring something from a backup can kind of do what comes naturally and just go looking in the natural place to go recover a file that you've been replicating somewhere and everything right. just holds together and they'll find what they were looking for, I think. Yeah, so it, it allows operators, uh, privileged users to basically get their data back on their own. Um, and then the last one was manual sync. So if we go into synchronize, 
Like if you go to archive here, so you'll see there's a manual archiving option that's been there for a while. Now we also have manual sync. And with a manual archive, you would have to then reference an archive plan, which would reference an archive index. With sync, we don't have any of that. We There's no index. So you can just do an ad hoc sync from here to there, basically, and you don't even need an arc, uh, you don't even need to set up a sync plan for that. And uh, as David pointed out already, you have all the sources here. Um, all of my other clients, like if I wanted to, this is my Linux-based server here. Uh, I'm on this computer here, so if I wanted to copy something from my iMac that I'm sitting at right now, I could select that one as the source, and I could say copy that to uh, the other iMac. No, it would be this one. Mm -hmm. I could select the volume and then kick off that same shop. Yeah. And that runs so, as a, uh, as a, I think it always runs as an update sync, so it won't do any deletes, which is safer. And if you're just replicating a, a folder full of data, probably to an empty folder, then that's fine. It's just going to copy everything that it finds across there. Correct. Yep. So that was the quick one through. Let me switch to this here. So I just picked a couple of issues from our support system uh, that we've come across lately. Um, and I thought I'd explain what the issue was, um, how we solved the issue, and uh, yeah. I'll do that for a couple of cases. So the first one was they had, they were synchronizing from um, one folder on a volume to another volume. And um, Okay, so the issue with this one was they were synchronizing from a volume and a folder on that volume to another volume. They didn't, like to the root of that target volume. Yeah. And when a volume dismounts by accident or intentionally and you issue a write command to the root of that volume, OS 10 will create a fake volume inside the slash volumes folder. It won't link to that actual volume because that volume is no longer mounted, but it will create a folder and it will start writing to that folder. And then in a lot of cases, the, the system volume that this fake volume is located on would eventually fill up and crash the server, basically. So the, the solution to that, and there's a knowledge base article on our support website, is to basically never reference the root of a volume as a sync target. Um, so instead of using something like this, which is what that particular customer used, set the target to something like that. And what happens in this case is the sync will start, it will look for this subfolder one, and if it can't find it, then it will just abort and you get an error message. If you don't do that, if you specify something like this, the real video backup two volume is not there, OS 10 will create it for you. And that's when you run into that problem. Yeah, which is exactly what you don't want because then you're getting a load of changes copied to the wrong place and then you have to merge those changes back to the real disk potentially when it comes back online and it just creates a yeah. whole a whole can of worms. So yeah, that's really, yeah. Good, really good to know. Yeah, and if, given that you sometimes may synchronize terabytes of data and your system volume may only be like a one or two or four terabyte disk, yeah. you're gonna fill up that volume, that system volume in no time. And when your system volume's full, your server's gonna go down and yeah. you wouldn't want that. Yeah. Um, right. The other case I, thought was interesting was there was a customer and he reported that they were getting IO errors and then the thing would fail to write to the target. Um, normally, whenever we saw IO errors, we would find that those were somehow related to the disk subsystem of the server hardware failure. Um, and you would be able to find reports of that in the system logs as well, because that would have been a system error. 
Now with this customer, we saw the IO, IO errors in the log, but there was nothing in the system logs. I'm like, well, how can this be? And um, so you can see that here, this was the sync command. So he was synchronizing from localhost, the volume mounted on localhost to another volume mounted on localhost. Uh, it was a single pass sync. This is where that delete first and then copy would come in. That would be set to one in that case. Um, target volume, source volume. And it wouldn't copy anything. And then in the file detail log, you would get these IO errors. Hmm. Um, so our developers dug into that and they found that it had to do with legacy resource forks. Like back in the old days, Mac files, they would usually have their data fork, the actual file, its contents, and then you had a resource fork that had all the extended attributes. Apple doesn't use, or most applications don't use resource forks anymore, but when you do, we need to handle those properly. And that process was broken in 5.6.0 and 5.6.1, and it was fixed in 5.6.2. But that's something that was kind of unusual. We figured out what it was. It was ours, our bug, and we fixed it. So it wasn't an issue in 5.5 versions either, probably. It's just something that was Correct, yeah, because we, we've done a lot of changes in 5.6 under the hood. And this was something that, I don't know, somehow got in there or... Yeah. I, I yeah. mean, I don't know in detail what caused it, but once we had determined that it wasn't a hardware error, but it had to be something in our code. Yep. Our developers were able to figure out what exactly caused this and fix it for 562. Cool. And okay. so, and then I was going to do a quick demo of a client to client sync. I had to wake up my other client again. Because I have screenshots, but I'll try a live demo first. So we'll go back to synchronize. Synchronized plan. So here's the plan that I created. And um, walking through this, I'm basically going to try to copy this folder from iMac i7 to another client, iMac AW, to this folder. And I'm doing this, these are both Macs, obviously, um, with a Linux P5 server managing that sync. Mm -hmm. So um, the other options I pretty much left at their defaults. There's nothing out of the ordinary here. So if I select this mirror sync and I say start now, monitor. So it copies, it basically scans the file system on the source, transfers it to the target, figures out the differences, sends a list back to the to the um, server, and then the server initiates a direct connection between the two clients. So while the P5 server manages this job, the data gets transferred directly between the two clients. Yeah. And so there that it was is. A, that was a feature that was added in 5.5, I think, wasn't it? That prior to 5.5, mm -hmm. you couldn't copy between two clients. You had to be copying either to the local host machine, the server, or back. Or, or from it, but now you can you have this additional flexibility. Right. Either the source or the target had to be licensed as a P5 server. Yeah. What this allows is that in some circumstances you could basically, well, you wouldn't need a license to, to. Um, yeah, that's absolutely true. So it might be that in the past customers had to buy an additional sync license to make one of the machines right. a server, so it could be responsible for a sync between itself and yeah. a client. And now that's not necessary. So, so yeah, it could you just be that... have to. Sorry, yeah, you you have to keep in mind that you're adding additional traffic, and that there's more. It makes it more complex if if you're now talking to three machines. One yeah. that sort of manages it, and then you you you. But the data doesn't the data. come via the server in the middle, does it? It goes directly from no. the, between the two clients. The server's just managing right. and running the logging of that task, but the data goes directly between the two machines in the most Correct. efficient way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you may have like a really stable, good, fast connection between the two clients. Mm -hmm. Let's say in between Munich and New York, but your 
your internet connection to the London head office where your servers are somewhat mm -hmm. flaky or much slower. Yeah. So you have to take that into account that that could potentially cause problems. But if everything's stable, everything's fast, no issues, then this is another option. Cool. Okay. And that's all I had. Cool. Well, thank you, Andre. Um, so I'll stop it, showing my screen and hand it back to you. Yeah, you can hand it back to me. Although I don't have anything more to show. But um, actually, if we leave it on yours, because maybe a question okay. relates to something that, okay. we could, that we could look at. So hang on to the the presenter status. Sure. Um, okay, so far we've just got a single question. Um, so if anybody else wants to ask a question, then you're welcome and we'll probably be able to answer it. The, I'll read the question that we've got from Chesapeake Systems, who are in the States, I think. Uh, yep. The question goes like this. How do new multi-threaded synchronized tasks interact? So this is talking about the multi-stream experimental feature. How do new multi-threaded synchronized tasks interact with P5 client bandwidth limits? We're trying to effectively limit the amount of site-to-site -site bandwidth consumed by a sync task for a client and don't fully understand how the percentage-based bandwidth limit is calculated or enforced. So maybe to illustrate this, it would help to begin, Andre, by just double-clicking on a client setup. Yep. Um, the additional options we'll see the we'll see the uh the bandwidth limiting setting there it is so, so it's a simple zero 20 to 100 in chunks of 20 percent so um do you have an answer for this one andre uh not off the top of my head i also i know that the whole bandwidth limitation thing has been reworked in 5.6 because mm. um, it wasn't always working the way it was supposed to work. Um, I also know that just recently this bandwidth limitation setting was geared towards like a gigabit ethernet connection. Mm -hmm. And so if you had a 10 gig ethernet connection and you would set it to 80%, it would set it to 80% over one gig. Ethernet connection. Okay. So it now scales to 10. Right. Um, I saw the ticket from Chesapeake just yesterday evening, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was going to look into that, get some more detail because I don't have the detail on how it works under the hood, what exactly the changes are in 5.6. Um, what I would expect, though, is that if you use the multi threading, um, that this bandwidth limit should take precedence over the multi-threading so yeah or maybe, can, maybe all the all the threads bandwidth combined. together combined to make the the percentage that um because it's a bit of a moving target isn't it because i know that p5 does like a dummy file transfer between the, the client and the server to establish what the uh, ma uh, total amount of bandwidth appears to be so that it can then figure out what 60% of that is, so that, so right. that it's got something to, to work against. But those, it's, it's, those measurements yeah, it's aren't always precise. Yeah. So it's although it's a a menu with five options in it that looks really simple, the implementation of it is is quite complex and there's a lot of moving parts. So um, yeah, maybe we'll put together a um, a tech info page to to help with a bit more information there and then you, you guys can look on the website and have a read of it. Maybe that's the best way to yeah, go. Yeah, I'll, I'll look into that ticket. I'll try to get some more information and then respond in that ticket as well. Yeah, but you're welcome to email support at Archiware if you want to get more, more detail on that later. Uh, okay, just revisiting and we've got some more questions. Uh, Justin from Mac1 says burglars. I must be missing something here because uh, have you got any burglars? Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. Andre, do you have any burglars in your room? Uh, no, that was my daughter. <laughs> okay, that's fine. She didn't steal anything. She is she's out sick with the flu and, and so she's not at school today. Okay, all right. So, yeah. I, I actually answered the questions already that it's clearly burglars because we also heard sirens earlier, so it must have been. <laughs> okay. And there must have been some law enforcement action. I think just, Justin maybe is part-time part policeman or something. Maybe he's one of those yeah. part-time police. Uh, another question from Chesapeake. Based on our testing so far, I think this is following up, 
With 5.62, it seems restricting the bandwidth to 40%, with two transfers still seems to consume 80 to 90 megabytes per second on a gigabit link. Okay, so maybe each of those transfers is obeying the total and not the other way around. So I guess that might be something that, we'll needs, that needs fine tuning, but yeah, we'll find out and you'll get, you'll get information on this, uh, Chesapeake. So I hope that's going to be useful to you. Uh, we don't have any other questions or alerts. So um, if everybody's happy with that, unless, unless somebody wants to type in a question right now, it's 40 minutes in. And I think we're planning on keeping these to half an hour, but we always run over. So thanks everybody for attending. Um, there'll be a video of this on RQWare's YouTube channel very soon. Um, if you want to share it with anybody that missed it or watch it again and again, um, there'll be another webinar. Uh, I forget the exact date, but approximately middle of next month. Um, so please sign up for that one. And um, yeah, I think that just about covers everything. So thanks for attending and see you next time. Cheerio. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.